It's that time of the year once again. When it comes to brand new video games, 2023 might be one of the best years ever, which is kind of the opposite of what we're trying to do here. Just about every month, you could grab yourself a game of the year candidate. From Armored Core 6 to Spider-Man 2, Baldur's Gate 3, Tears of the Kingdom, or one of the ridiculously high quality remakes, you could be eaten anytime. Video games are pretty all right, you might think to yourself, unless you're a developer, in which case, yeah, maybe not so much. Despite the high quality releases left and right, we also had as many closures, layoffs everywhere, ugly leaks, getting played off the stage in 30 seconds, and the ever looming threat of the acquisition. Shout out to the devs, we love you. This year, I've spent a lot of time playing games for this channel, and when my PlayStation year in review said Marvel's Square Enix's The Avengers, I <laughs> knew I needed to make a change. So I beat the entirety of Pikmin 4 in three days, and now it's time to embark on the annual expedition. For every big hit in 2023, there were 10 or more games that were bad or disappointing, and this set of 365 rotations of the sun around the earth has given us some of the loudest flops in recent memory. And I'm not talking about AI generated nonsense, I'm talking about things made maybe with a little bit of heart, but that totally missed the mark. Or, you know, games I didn't like too much. I don't like it! I don't like to think about it! See y'all, it's Austin, and wouldn't you have it, it's been a full year already. It's time for the annual tradition of the worst and most disappointing video games of the year. 2023 was actually pretty freaking good, so much so that I'm actually thinking about doing a whole video talking about things that I did like, so if that's something you wanna see, let me know down below. But we gotta start with the stinky first. I made sure to do a lot of digging as well, otherwise this would just be me talking about King Kong and Gollum for like 30 minutes and, well, I mean, they're here, but there's a lot more too. There were a lot of contenders coming out at the end of the year here, like in mass, and I made sure to play as many as I could and during countless hungry, sleepless nights. And speaking of food, thankfully, I was able to keep myself satisfied with one of my favorites and today's sponsor, Factor. Good food on the go. This winter, if you're too busy to cook, which if you're anything like me, you are, Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are a perfect solution. For those looking to have flexible meal options while skipping the mess in the kitchen, Factor's got your back and everything can be ready in just two minutes. It's the holidays. And this year, Factor's keeping my fridge stocked while I'm sitting around working hard and playing some of the worst video games of all time. There's over 35 weekly flavors to pick from, each of which are packed with flavor and are all dietitian approved. Are you vegan? Sure. There's also choices for vegetarians, keto friendly, lower calorie counts, or just big amounts of protein. Just remove it from the packaging, toss it in the microwave or oven if you're fancy, slap it onto a plate because we're civilized and enjoy yourself some quick bites. This week, I was a big fan of their green pepper and beef casserole. It's everything I like anyways, and it's a nice full meal to chow down. On. With each box, you can pick up some add-ons like some gingerbread oats or one of their flavor-packed smoothies. I love these things, they're great on the go. Factor is now also owned by HelloFresh, who we've worked with in the past, so between the two brands, there's plenty of options to pick from. So head on over to factor75.com or click the link down in the description and use the code ERUPTION50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. I'm gonna order me another one right now. ERUPTION50 for 50% off your first box. Thanks to Factor for the sponsor, but for now it's time to head back to my yearly destiny, the worst and most disappointing video games of 2023. I got like a whole stack of physical stuff too. I, I spent money, I'm ready. So I think why not get this video started the only way we know how with licensed games. This year was crazy for those. You had really good ones like Spider-Man and whatnot, but then on the flip side, there was, you know, the immense amount of shovelware that you've seen dominating all the headlines. Although I think I came across a couple that people might have missed. Licensed games are back, baby. There's been this slow burn of bottom tier movie, cartoon, and TV show tie-in games making a resurgence over the last generation, but 2023 was full force. It's really a the good, the bad, and the ugly type of situation with bona fide hits like Spider-Man 2 coming out a mere week after Skull Island Rise of Kong. It's been a while since people were able to fully rally behind a bad game, and I expected nothing better from the developers behind G.I. Joe Operation Blackout. Oh, and good old Game Mill Entertainment, whose name continues to be an exact representation of what they do. In 2023 alone, they published five different licensed games varying in quality from meh to Skull Island Rise of King Kong, and this one's really as bad as they say. Despite 
despite being the mighty King Kong, your power is reduced to straight jobber status as any, and I mean anything, will knock you out at a moment's notice. Enemies will do damage without you being able to parse what's happening, and moving around is a pain in the butt. There's several moments where you can fall through the world into zones way sooner than you should. In fact, I'm just getting stuck in the walls on the regular. It doesn't help that the geometry likes to shift around if you're moving. These mountains are alive. Usually, I try to play these things for several hours to really get a feel for the mission the developers were setting out to do, but considering Game Mill allegedly didn't give it enough time to cook, I could barely stomach it for more than an hour. It's just boring, which is the worst thing you could say about something that's made to be fun. Although the fact that they used a PNG here will never not be funny. Monkey see, monkey do, this wouldn't even be Game Mill's lowest reviewed. Coming in with a review score so low, even God Hand is better. The Walking Dead Destinies. Move over Death Stranding. This is the definitive video game version of Norman Reedus. Walking Dead Destinies is like every other Walking Dead video game release since the first Telltale one. Not good. It's brimming with all sorts of issues. The cutscenes are weird, frozen pans of scenes. The combat feels two decades older than it is, and all of it just feels like a low tier PlayStation 3 release. Just not in the fun, janky, haha -ha way. It's similar to Skull Island, just Kind of boring. So let's focus on another licensed game mill joint that also sucked. Avatar. No, not of the James Cameron variety. I'm talking about Avatar The Last Airbender Quest for Balance. Bet y'all forgot about this one. That didn't turn out so good. Let's go. I don't know why every Avatar release needs a Temple Run minigame, but here we are. Avatar The Last Airbender Quest for Balance is a retelling of the original animated series, except worse in every way. Do you like giant missing subplots and entire characters being gone? This one's for you. Imagine Dragon Ball Z Kai as a video game, except it skipped a ton of important things and was a bargain bin Zelda clone. Like a terrible version of Legacy of Goku. Quest for Balance plays like a nothing burger Zelda clone. You run stage to stage, solving puzzles, doing mini quests, and pushing blocks. It actually felt decent at first, well, besides the voice acting. You follow GPS point to GPS point, doing the thing, talking to whatever person, and completing task. It's the second you get into a fight that you realize, oh, oh no. I didn't uh, want this. <laughs> You. This thing feels bad, which is probably why they spread it out so much. You'll go 10 to 20 minutes at a time without fighting anything, but when combat starts, it turns into this barely functioning system that has no impact. You just kind of press buttons and things perish. Feedback be damned. Boss fight mechanics? Forget about what? it. Ugh. The cutscenes that cover the show aren't the actual animations from the cartoon and are instead just moving stills. I feel like they ran out of budget immediately because there's a small handful of cutscenes and quotations in engine, but the rest are all these stills. Also a lot of this. <laughs> Thankfully, well maybe, Quest for Balance has a multiplayer mode which makes things slightly better. It can only be accessed once you're already a few levels in at a statue and it's the epitome of younger sibling mode because anytime you move slightly off camera, the second player gets teleported away, which means you could do this. This was the most fun I had with Avatar, griefing. Although it's a little less fun when you realize you're gonna have to do all the platforming puzzles with a constantly shifting camera where any slight movement can cause it all to get messed up or you know, fall endlessly into pits and die. For some reason, the boss fights seem to toss you into the same situation over and over. You fight Zuko three times before anything else in a span of two hours, and it's like, what's going on here? <laughs> Yo, check out this run cycle. Game Mill, or technically Bamtang Games, who are responsible for all of these. But hey, at least this one has voice acting. My cabbages! And thus ends the yearly Game Mill section. Um, it's kind of... Depressing that I can have one of these every 12 months, but thanks for the content. We ain't done with licensed games yet though, as I told y'all. We're so back, and so is Jumanji for some reason.
It has been four years since the last Jumanji film, so why did we get a new one of these now? The answer is, uh, I don't know, but they managed to hold on to those actor likenesses so you can take Dwayne Johnson, Kevin Hart, Karen Gillan, and Jack Black on a wild adventure. Zuh. This kind of popped out of nowhere, being announced a few months prior to launch, and then, well, it's only got four Metacritic reviews and two on Steam, so this was the Wild West. When a Jumanji video game gets no coverage, you know licensed tie-ins are back. This one just happened happens to be developed by the people who brought us Hellpoint. <laughs> what? Unlike the previous Jumanji game, which was a third-person shooter heavily resembling Fortnite that was total ass, this one has a lot of promise. First off, it's four-player co-op, and if you're looking at the screen right now, you might be like, hey, this kind of looks like a GameCube or PS2 game. And, well, it kind of is. The best way to describe Jumanji Wild Adventures is that it's basically Shrek 2 the game. Just worse. You drive level to level in a van that made me immediately want to play Jackal instead before going through co-op platforming stages that start out with a lot of promise. Punch bad dudes, collect the letters of Jumanji to spell one, continuously dodge roll because it's faster than running, and then laugh about Jack Black's animation. <laughs> it's like, hey, this reminds me of when I was a kid, therefore this is comfortable. Just instead filled with amazing Dwayne impersonations. Yeah, that. What is up with you guys? Haven't you ever heard of a safe? Who took it this time? Oh, the others aren't any better. You'd think I'd be used to this body by now, but nope. Could be worse. Hello? Look at me! The first level starts off promising, and I was considering dropping this from the video. The stage design was intuitive, the objective's easy to track, and it really kind of is like playing a crappy licensed game with friends back when I was 12. Then, almost immediately, that drops off the cliff. The levels become way too chaotic for multiplayer. It's a visual mess, and anytime there's an explosive barrel, it's an instant kill with a hitbox that's impossible to read. I somehow tricked a few others into playing with me, and the only reason and we stopped several hours in is because we actually got stuck. I guess we're here forever. All in all, my final rating for Jumanji Wild Adventures is, um, which is also how I reacted to the news of Inspector Gadget Mad Time Party. Xbox gamers, we've heard you loud and clear. It's coming to Xbox. All one hour and 10 minutes of it, according to every long play on the internet. Yeah, no, I'm not spending $20 on this or the latest Sword Art Online game. Look, I'm sure this sucks just as hard as the previous five of these. It probably forces you into playing as Kirito again, but I'm too old and tired to subject myself to Sword Art anymore, though I'm not above Lord of the Rings Gollum. The Untold Story, a game where the recent Steam reviews are mostly positive. <laughs> it must have been packed to 2.1. All right, I can't poke fun at this too much. Gollum is a concept that was kind of doomed from the get-go, but it also led to the closure of Datalik Entertainment's development side, who were responsible for some adventure titles I liked a good bit. But to be fair, this one's really bad. <laughs> Make sure to toggle on ray tracing, that's just what we need. Gollum is a simple title, you play as Gollum and Smeagol as they argue amongst themselves. It's actually a gameplay mechanic. It's an adventure stealth platformer with two hooks that you do over and over for an entire nine hours. Not only that, this one's for the most Tolkien faithful, as it covers a period in the third age only shown in unfinished tales. Basically, Gollum wants to get the ring and spends an entire video game being a prisoner, getting captured, being a prisoner again and generally having a miserable time. This ain't an episode of Happy Days, that's for sure. I do admire the clear love for the source material here. Visually, Mordor is as ugly as you'd want it to be. The orcs are mean and gross, and there's some ideas executed decently here. It just also feels like crap. It's filled with game-breaking glitches, totally uninspired level design, and all of the characters look straight up uncanny valley. Anytime Gollum's looking at the screen, it looks like a joke someone cooked up for source filmmakers. Where's this fancy ray tracing now? It's hard to care about that when everything is so static. Following a similar trend, just like Jumanji, I got hard locked in a level pretty early on and was unable to continue without totally restarting it. Why does this keep happening? But Gollum did do one thing the other licensed games here didn't. I jumped on a pit of lava and got a trophy called Wait Wait Not Yet. So I guess I was rewarded for killing myself. Suicide is badass! No, 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 no. All in all, Gollum is one of those experiences you look at and think, why? Who wanted this? Props for the unique concept in a fictional world with tons of games already, but I'm not so sure freaking Gollum was the Hail Mary hook they needed. Oh, and something something breeding pits. Give it to us. Roar and 
And with this, that's all the time for licensed games this time around. Most of the big ones were covered to death this year, and I don't think I had the mental fortitude to play another hour of Kong. I've probably heard enough anyway. So this next section goes out to everyone. The biggest failures of 2023 came out of nowhere. They weren't things that you could see coming from a mile away. Like, no one was sitting there thinking that Metal Gear Survive was gonna change the world, but they might have had thoughts about Mortal Kombat 1, sp specifically for the Switch. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't know how we ended up in a situation with no PS4, but the Switch. But this port of MK1 is hilarious. I liked MK1 a good bit, and this is a worse version of it in uh, every single way. Ridiculous loading times, ugly textures, terrible slowdown, and x-rays that look like someone took a blur and smudge tool in Photoshop to a screenshot. I thought they wouldn't do this, considering how terrible the crypt look in MK11's port, but money, I guess. I hope all 25 Switch Mortal Kombat fans got what they wanted. They certainly got more than any who bought the new port of Red Dead Redemption. $50 for a 13 year old game with no proper remastering. Sure, I guess. However, both of those make way more sense than whatever the heck happened with Flashback 2. What happens when you make a sequel to a cult classic 30 years later with the original creator? Some people might say g Reco, which is unfortunate, and other times it ends up underbaked and with a whopping 36 on Metacritic. You'd think, considering how rough the remake was, they'd learn from that and go into a more traditional cinematic platformer direction, but no. No, they went full-on Metroidvania. Also, despite showcasing a 2.5D point of view, you've got 3D movement, which does not work. You'll be jumping around, getting stuck on walls and edges, and combat has you mashing a single button and hoping the shots connect. Levels and missions don't have proper trackers or descriptions, so it's very easy to get lost, and despite 30 years of technological evolution, it's lacking any kind of sleek visual style, which is a strength of flashback. What should have been a slam dunk is instead a massive disappointment and yet another blemish on the original's legacy. Which is gonna be a theme, y'all. Infinity Strash Dragon Quest The Adventures of Die is an underwhelming entry in one of Square Enix's most prolific franchises that failed both fans of the show and game. It's basically a retelling of the anime with uninteresting gameplay and static images instead of, you know, the, the show they made. Then you got Bethesda. <laughs> Man, did they have a rough year. Both Redfall and Starfield have had a ton of negative press for various reasons. Reasons. I covered Redfall in my bad AAA games video from earlier this year, and that thing is still rough all these months later. Meanwhile, Starfield has been this slow burn bad experience where general audiences are feeling disappointed, especially in comparison to other Bethesda titles. Recently, Starfield's reached mostly negative on Steam. It didn't win at the Game Awards, and even the modders have given up on the thing, stating that it's quote, trash. When even the modders don't want to fix the Bethesda games anymore, you know you've disappointed. I haven't had the chance to try out Starfield myself, but when all the early reviews were saying it doesn't pick up and get good for several hours, I decided to wait. I'll give it a go myself at some point, I just gotta find some time between all of these. Quick shout out to Modern Warfare 3. I played the free weekend where you could do like the zombies mode, which was basically a DMZ map flipped into an extraction shooter and uh, uh, yeah. Also, the menus in that game leave a lot to be desired. I don't really have any personal attachment to that, though. If we're looking at a big release that made me wonder what in the world happened, there's none more befuddling than Payday 3. Payday 3 hurts. It's also an indication of a larger problem in the gaming industry. If you don't know, the Payday series are games where you play as the bad guys stealing stuff, robbing banks, breaking into jewelry stores, trying to make it out alive with your reward. Payday 2 was a big deal when it released ages ago on Steam, and it's something that you can easily get me to hop back into any day. Although I might pass on the several hundred dollars of DLC. Even so, that's several years of updates, gameplay tweaks, optimization, and progress in a game that is very much playable to this day. In fact, as of writing this, it's got around 40,000 people playing it on the reg. Payday 3? It's not even close. Payday 3 feels like an unfinished product. It's lacking all sorts of quality of life updates from the predecessor. It's poorly optimized, running terribly on my 3080. It can't walk around your cool hideout and look at bags of cash you stole. You're instead relegated to a static menu with dailies on the side. The basic starting loadout is jobber level, and it feels bad to totally start over in something that you 
might have already been top tier at. I look at Payday 3 and think, why did this need to exist? I don't think that it's a bad game, not by a long shot. It's just severely underwhelming when you can grab a better version of it for 99 cents on the Steam sale. And it seems like basically everyone agrees when you look at the player count, the reviews, and the reception with the third one here ending up all over worst of the year lists. I think Starbreeze Studios can turn this around over time if they focus on quality over monetization, but as it stands, there's just no reason to pick this one up. Which sucks because I love the second one. The first one's all right. At least the music is still a 10 out of 10. I wanted Payday 3 to be a banger real bad. But alas, there were too many games this year, so thanks for giving me more time to play those. Speaking about things that I was interested in, what about games that were disappointing specifically for me? If you go around and ask people what games sucked or what disappointed them, there's a high chance that they're gonna have a totally different answer. I'm sure someone out there is upset about like Super Mario RPG for whatever reason. I've got a couple weird ones myself, but probably the biggest regret has to be the PlayStation VR 2. I don't even, it's not even in my house anymore. Hey, remember when this came out this year? Remember all the games that came with it that people still talk about? How about the fact that one of the highest reviewed releases of the year, VR or not, isn't even on the thing? Asgard's Wrath 2, Oculus only, baby. I had originally picked up a VR 2 because I got sucked in by the hype machine close to its release and was super into the idea of being able to play some stuff in my own house without having to screw cameras into the wall. As it stands, there's a decent amount of titles out there supporting the VR 2, but not making the thing backwards compatible was a huge mistake. Instead of being able to experience things like Final Fantasy XV fishing, Iron Man VR, Blood and Truth, or Astrobot Rescue Mission in better resolution with stronger hardware, we've got the smallest of first party support and then a lot of ports. There is a shocking lack of exclusives on the thing. No Asgard's Wrath 2 and not much on the horizon. Just Horizon Call of the Mountain, which is good, but where's the sauce? It hasn't even been a year yet, so there's still time, but we will see. Speaking of the passage of time, does anyone remember Wolong Fallen Dynasty? Team Ninja's gotten a lot of notoriety for their Souls adjacent games with Neo and Stranger of Paradise, so when they announced Wolong, fans of those were excited. It even got solid reviews. So why did I and everyone I know fall off of this thing harder than Oasis? I'm not sure if it was just the repetition and yearly release cycle of this style or genre burnout, but even the most diehard of Souls fans I know felt a collective meh about it. The story and dialogue leave a lot to be desired, and some of the stage design feels cobbled together in comparison to other releases. Obviously, some people like this one, but Wolong just didn't resonate with me. At minimal, it does do its best to give you a full video game without over monetizing the player, unlike Disney Speedstorm. I wanted this to be good. I really did. I love me a kart racer, and I also love me a kart racer with production value and a big goofy license. Then you see the developer, Gameloft, which meant it was going to be on your phone, and you're going to have to dump a lot of money into it. It took seconds between launching and hitting the button as it showed me store pages, free daily pools, things to spend money on, and the latest seasons of content, some of which I couldn't beat unless I spent grindable resources to level up my character. There was no reason for Speedstorm here to be a free-to-play mobile resource draining game, but they did that, and it's a massive shame, especially because it's kind of fun to play too. I mean, what else is going to let me do some sick drifting as Mulan through Steamboat Willy World as dated jungle dubstep fusion plays. Which brings me to the next kid-friendly franchise that disappointed a 33-year-old man. Keeping it fast, Sonic the Hedgehog. Earlier this year, on the same day as Skull Island actually, Sonic Superstars. Out of the gate, let me be clear, Sonic Superstars isn't bad. I think it's a really cute concept. You do the four player new Super Mario Brothers thing, but with everyone's favorite blue speedster. It just also happens to be one of the safest and most uninspired takes on Sonic since 4. I played this for several hours as different characters and all I could think was, this sure is a game. Which is very unlike me because I'm God's strongest Sega soldier. I have this freak test for every Sonic game to test the physics. In the classic releases, you could jump at the apex of a loop, hit the ground, and get running for a quick speed boost. I did this all the time. Superstars? Nope, not at all. Stupid, sure, but this always makes me take a step back. To add to that, a lot of the level design felt like retreads of previous concepts. The bosses all utilized familiar mechanics, and once again, it's just safe. I do enjoy playing as Amy with the ability to double jump, as that changes things a bit, but when all's said and done, I turn this off and I'm struggling to remember anything about what I just played. The cutscenes are cute, though. Weirdly, this 
is exactly what I expected after learning it was developed by RZS, the devs of Balan Wonder World. Hey, remember that? Better times. Last up on the personal disappointments, and one that anyone who knows me already knows, WrestleQuest. And of course they're... I think this one almost nailed it. Mega Cat Studios and Skybound Entertainment's WrestleQuest is a proper love letter to the sport that I love so much. It features tons of classic wrestlers, all of whom support you, the player, as you rise up the ranks to become a professional wrestler. You play as either Brink Logan or Randy Santos as you engage in turn-based battles where you do the whole wrestling thing. There's no create a character here, which is a big shame out the gate. Though there is a ton of care in the animations and presentation, the individual sprites are ridiculously expressive. The dialogue and story go full hog into Smelly Mark territory, and there's enough here to make any fan of the combat sport point at the screen and go, whoa, I love everything about this, except the gameplay. Turn-based role-playing games are my bread and butter. It's the thing I grew up with. I'm just not so sure it really works with the concept of wrestling. The modern approach to turn-based combat is quick and snappy, but WrestleQuest's battles take a lot of time. You have to build up hype to get maximum reward, sometimes do certain conditions to dictate the battle as you would in the ring. Maybe you need to let someone out of your pen. There's also a ton of encounters on the map, and what this causes are endless engagements that overstay their welcome quick. You start feeling that you want to get out of combat as soon as possible, so you're spamming special gimmick moves in order to be done. And that's not the way you want to approach your RPG, which is sad, because I love looking at this and breathing it all in. I didn't get to beat it for this video, because it is long, and more than likely I'll end up doing it anyways. But it didn't grab me in the several hours that I played. And for something so directly targeted at me, the dude who loves wrestling and RPGs, that's disappointing. But if you do play it, you better get used to the constant Macho Man impression. The cream of the crop! All right, time to emotionally detach. Mostly because I don't want to talk about Final Fantasy 16, and yes, I know I'm alone and kind of a freak for that one, and I'm not gonna waste anyone's time with my ramblings about giant dudes with axes that take three stagger hits to take down. Nope, not gonna do it. So instead, I want to talk about the more ridiculous releases from this year, the games that you look at and think, why did this get made? But while I'm on the topic of Square Enix, I might as well talk about that dumb AI thing they made. Square Enix AI Tech Preview, the Portopia Serial Murder Case. Why? Rocking in with a very negative on Steam, the Portopia Serial Murder Case is a free, I guess, tech demo remake of an 80s NX adventure mystery game. One written by wow. Yuji Horii, one of the main people behind all of Dragon Quest. <laughs> so of course, why not turn this legendary, influential game into a showcase for Square Enix's AI tech? One that has natural language processing that will totally understand what you're talking about. Good luck interrogating without any help. Also turns out Square removed the AI language generation as they feared people would make awful content with it, so this is just like a simple prompt reader, no different than a text adventure from the 80s. What a waste. Kinda like Silent Hill Ascension. Is, is this a game? It has a battle pass, so it must be a game. Allegedly, a choose-your-own-adventure interactive series you can download on your phone, Ascension is what happens when an IP holder doesn't understand what they have. Basically, players, the audience, watch episodes weekly to help determine the path of the story. Allegedly, over 36 potential endings have been created but there's this weird feeling that the whole production of this thing has been missing the mark. At first there was a live chat, one that banned the word Kojima from appearing, but allowed much worse. Then they just turned it off. Then the developers got on stream in the app to tell people why this is dope, actually. Regardless of the quality, it's hard to take seriously when you have the ability to unlock a giant It's Trauma sticker in game. Ascension is still running, so maybe it can redeem itself, <laughs> but uh, probably not. Who is this for? I'd assume the same people who wanted a sequel to 1-2 Switch. As in, no one. Everybody 1-2 Switch. The first party Nintendo exclusive sequel to everyone's favorite 4 out of 10 launch title. It's this party game that Nintendo should have sat on, but didn't. Initial playtest revealed that children and families weren't having fun, it was announced less than a month prior to its release, and barely promoted. Nintendo just said, eh, we already did the work, just send it out, and what we got is another 4 out of 10 game. I maintain that the original should have been a pack-in title for the Switch, and considering 
considering this launched at a budget $30 new, it doesn't seem like they had any faith either. Also, we couldn't do this video without bringing up the day before. I was a little late on the train for this one, deep in the ad for game dimension, so I totally missed its brief period on sale, but whew, this one made a stink. Now seen as mostly a scam, TLDR, the day before was announced as an MMO survival title. It had a small but dedicated following that witnessed it get delay after delay, and then finally they just threw it out there in early access this December. Totally different from what was promised, filled with game breaking glitches, countless technical issues, and well, reviews speak for themselves. Four days after release, the studio shut down, attempting to take the money in a run. It was removed from Steam, and the servers are gonna be shut down in a month. <laughs> Lord, that's a lot. I never got to play this one myself, and based off everything I just said, will not, but like Silent Hill Ascension, I assume we haven't heard the last of it. I guess the day before is essentially abandoned wear and shovelware, which I seem to be pretty good about summoning from the abyss. Earlier this year, we put out a video talking about reality TV show games. Not even two weeks later, Microids would announce another survivor video game, Castaway Island. Obviously, it's my civic duty to cover it, and wouldn't you know, it's bad. It might actually be worse than the previous ones. Look, we're no stranger to shovelware around these parts. 2023 had a ton of it too. Beyond what we've already talked about, there's cheap tie-in nonsense for all sorts of properties. Apparently, Bluey the game is one of the worst of the year, but I'm way too old for that. So instead, we're gonna talk about our new best friends, the Coco Tribe. We've got Alexis, a social media star. Morgan here's a pro dirt bike rider and uh, I'm a flat earther. And I think the soundstage we're on is of the highest production value. Day one, live or die, let's go. I'm not even five minutes into this thing. Castaway Island is a survivor game sans Jeff Probst. It's probesless. it's the most low effort money grubbing attempt at a video game I've seen in a hot minute. All of the menus are low effort, the font looks 20 years old. Why is the survivor logo so small on the main menu? You pick a random tribe member, yeah, you don't even get to make your own, and then get thrown into endless mini game after mini game. There's a social aspect here as well, like in the show, where you have to walk around and guess what people wanna hear you say, most of the time it makes no sense. This Coral Island clone has you searching the island looking for supplies to bring back to camp and you can also talk amongst your tribe. I was curious if hunger would affect you like in the DS game, but it doesn't seem to, so you can just skip the island survival collection process altogether and just deal with everyone hating you if you win every mini game. And you probably will considering they're all simple or Simon Says quick time events. Although if you do lose, it's time to vote. Or you can just fail at the merge trial and be kicked out of the game instantly because that that's fun in a video game. You do get the opportunity to talk to other players prior to voting, but the system to talk to people really is similar to the 2000s PC release. And by that I mean it sucks, barely makes any sense, so good luck pulling a vote or blindside off. I mean, come on, without the host of the dang show, this whole thing is empty, soulless, and without any merit. The minigames suck, the dialogue sucks, interfacing with the island sucks, and... There's this horrible tinnitus inducing sound anytime you pan over camp. No thanks. Survivor Castaway Island. The tribe has spoken. Back to the shovelware to mention with you. Man, there's not even voiceover for voting. What's going on here, Microids? I do love this wiggle animation though. This must be where Jack Black got it. Sad. All right, it's time for our last game of the video, and it's one that I've got very interested in in the last week. Like an intense flurry of passion over the dumbest thing you've ever seen. I bought Crime Boss Rock A City without knowing a single thing about it. I'm so glad I did. And this thing is wild. Crime Boss Rock A City is one of the strangest things that's come out in recent times. It's the first release by a new Czech dev, In-Game Studios, published by 505 Games who have a very mixed track record. They band together to hire every available B-list celebrity under the sun. Danny Trejo, Michael Rooker, Vanilla Ice, and of course our lead man, Michael Madsen. Definitely put his all into the role. Being a greenhorn in Rock A, I needed someone hooked up and if she ain't well f <laughs> well, new adventures await, buddy. Oh yeah. Beyond showing us its terrible name and a bunch of celebrities, that initial trailer didn't really explain what Crime Boss was. You might just be surprised to find out that it's a single player roguelite payday clone. Yep, a payday clone exists and came out in the same year as the disappointing sequel. On top of that, 505 Games published Payday 2 and not 3, so it's uh, a little suspicious. Unfortunately, Crime Boss is what happens when you make Payday suck. 
suck. The story is easy to understand. You play as a new guy on the block, the Candyman, as you loot, rob, fight, steal, and moita your way to being the new crime boss. If you die, don't worry, it's a roguelite. Restart with all your level up bonuses, or more realistically, restart over and over, continue to grind out levels for more gear and stats until you're no longer a weak piece of paper. At launch, Rocky City was bare bones, and to top it off, felt like absolute crap. Your guns feel weak, the level design doesn't seem intuitive, and the raid modes show how brain dead the gameplay is. If you need to take over a turf, you just send dudes into a map and shoot the win. The idea of a single player payday is fantastic, but this is not it. Especially because you're thrown in the constant cutscenes featuring these actors here for a <laughs> payday and nothing else. The script is bizarre and childish. It's like listening to that one kid in high school who just learned a few curse words and cannot wait to say them. And that little f mellow yellow. Oh, f yeah, that's a tough goddamn team. You can bury those fuckers every single one. Mm, f yeah. God better be. I couldn't even tell when the game was actually supposed to start, as you're forced into two game overs before actual gameplay takes over. It's this fever dream of micro cutscenes not properly lip synced with celebrities clearly not caring about what's going on. That's actually an appealing factor to me, a man who loves B-tier movies and games, but it's wholly unoriginal in all the other aspects. There are other modes you can play, and as you can probably tell, it's continuously getting updates. There's a co-op mode where you just do missions almost identical to the board in Payday 2, then there's mini campaigns starring the peanut gallery of 50 plus celebrities needing a job. I just so happened to launch this for the first time during the Christmas event, so every single enemy is walking around with giant snowman heads. This is how I will forever remember this. And also the fact that the guns feel terrible, you have to grind a lot in order to play as any of the characters in the cover, and the robbing mechanics are worse versions of what already existed. Anytime you grab money, the camera leans forward and zooms into the stealing. What is this? The ability to hold two bags at a time by default is nice, but not enough. Sorry to the dude whose game I joined online and immediately led us all to death. I wasn't ready for the frame rate to plummet to the 10s on a PlayStation 5. All in all, Crime Boss Rock A City sucks. It's a bad payday clone backed by an eager publisher that somehow managed to make itself an Epic Game Store exclusive. I kind of love it for how stupid it is, but it's also absolutely one of the worst games of 2023. Now, curse away. Little f and Roden Yellow is cornered. This is our shot to knock his f***ing little d*** in the dirt. Let's do it. So there you have it. The worst and most disappointing video games of the year. The annual tradition hath been sealed and now I must sleep for an entire year, which means I'll probably catch you on like two weeks. Special shout out to Wanted Dead. Like, I know it's really bad, but I can't help but love it. It's one of those so bad it's good games. Honorary game of the year. So that's 2023 in the bag. And I have to thank y'all all for the generous support. It's None of this would be possible without you. If you like this video and want to support the channel, make sure to check out the sponsor, Factor. Or if you'd rather support more directly, there's the Patreon and you can buy a t-shirt over at the Pixel Empire. Anyways, I've been Austin and I'm going to keep it short. See you guys in 2024. Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Aaron Quolek, Benna Oswald, Blackfoot Ferret, Blake Thomas, Cheeks, Chris Shelton, Doug Prince, DX Buster, Dylan Snyder, GM Pinks, Hey Quiggles, Idlevice, Jay Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Karen Arter, Rare Find It, Ryan Talbert, and Vox. Thank you all so much for the generous support. And this here is the last video of the year. I have one more thing I'm gonna be releasing in January and then I'm actually gonna be moving, so I'll be on a slight hiatus, but I have plenty of stuff I want to release throughout the rest of the year. I'm super excited to get to a new place, get a new setup, so things will be changing on screen, but it's still going to be the same old me. I just might be a little colder. For now, I'm going to enjoy a small break, play a bunch of video games, and uh, I don't know, February's coming up. That's like 50 games come out at the same time. Okay, I'm going to go. I love you. Bye-bye.